Hi everyone, I'm Jim McSorley, author of the McSorley 442 Chassis Plans and curator of 7ask.com. In this video, I'd like to demonstrate how I got to a certain point in my build, focusing on the front suspension, how I went about designing it and building it as you see here. There's two goals in creating this video. One is to show you the process that I went through in hopes that it might help you in your build. And the second reason is to solicit your feedback and uh, any uh, ideas or suggestions you might have for me to improve this design before I weld everything together. I'm not going to go into many of the principles of suspension design. There's lots of books and lots of threads on the internet to cover that information. But I do want to share with you my general philosophy. If the lower control arm is relatively horizontal to the ground, then the upper control arm is going to be angled inward toward the chassis at an angle that is, some people say, roughly 13 degrees. Uh, I say anywhere between 10 and 15 is going to get you in the right ballpark. And in this design, I'm going to show you how I've created adjustability for the inner pivot of the upper control arm. And the, the upper control arm itself is adjustable, thereby allowing you to control camber and caster from the upper control arm. Using this approach, you'll be able to create a front suspension geometry that meets your particular donor parts with very little math and very little measuring. Controlling camber throughout the range in motion is the primary objective of this double wishbone suspension, but the math involved can be get very complicated, so I'm going to show a very practical and straightforward approach that allows for adjustability, moving the inner pivot points of the upper control arm and allowing you to control that angle as well allowing you to control the length of these upper tubes thereby uh, defining the camber and caster for your particular design. I'm not going to go into detail around spindle choices and, and these types of things although ball joints that meet your particular needs do have to be identified. The purpose here is to be able to find a solution with very, very little math, a very practical application that you can use almost like a universal solution for building your own suspension and uh, not needing to specify the exact geometry because every combination of donor parts and chassis is going to be unique to your particular need. The solution here is one of adjustability and adaptability, not specification of geometry. Some of the parts I'm going to be demonstrating their use today include a threaded ball joint sleeve and a ball joint that needs to be sourced for your particular application. So the taper here is either 7 degrees or 10 degrees. 7 is most common and the diameter is going to be a factor. This is an upper ball joint. It's smaller. It uses a smaller ring at 2 and a quarter di uh, diameter. They make a larger ring that's over 2 and a half inch in diameter as well, typically for the lower but I found you can use upper ball joints for both top and bottom. This threads in very easily. It's one inch high sleeve, can be welded into a one inch tubing. I recommend the use of DOM or drawn over mandrill, D-O-M tubing, and I prefer to use very thick wall. This is eighth inch wall, and this will be attached. Uh, I'll show you later how we attach these two. The process starts by understanding the width of the rear axle when you have the wheels and tires and brakes and everything that you plan to run in your final build. So it's about 48 and a half. And we're going to bring that measure to the front of the vehicle. The goal being to establish the same track width in the front. A little bit wider is okay. You can see that I've indicated which side of the tape is the center line of the chassis. And what I'm going to do is use that to measure to the inside of the rim on the front tire. You can see that I've placed a threaded rod through the front bracket. The front bracket was positioned previously based on measurements taken from the book. I found that that seems to be just the right measure when constructing the lower wishbones 
on a, on a book frame or anything that's similar to having a, a, book, a spread. Okay. Now we're going to install two pieces of 2x4, one on each of the indicators. But the basic idea is that these tubes will line up. Once I cut the fish mouth, everything will line up as shown here. Notice that the spread at the bottom is determined by the distance between the two by fours. It's really easy to see here how the diameter of the sand belt sander is nearly the same as the diameter of the steel ring. So now you can see when everything's placed in position, the fish mouth easily fits against the ring. There's a protrusion here, a gap along the, along the wood. So when I hold this in order to tack weld it, I need to make sure that I lift it up just like that, just enough to be able to create a flat surface along the very bottom of this control arm. You might also notice that the length of the control arm at this point has not been determined. I held it by hand when I tack welded these pieces together. But you can see on the bottom edge how it's important that we make sure we bias toward the side, toward the top, because we want to make sure the ball joint sleeve can thread in. Here you can see I'm using a rather crude but effective technique to make sure that the spread on the bottom control arms is uh, appropriately defined by the edge of the 2 by 4s I'm still sure to have everything proper distance apart. I'm just going to flip this over and do a few more tack welds on this ring just to make sure it's in the right spot. So here it is tack welded and you can see it's somewhat of an imperfect science. There is a little bit of a gap on either side but what you're going to find is that's kind of normal. I'll be able to compensate for that and it'll actually help me because my next step is to place these bushing tubes in this location. I'm just going to transfer the red line, scribe that, kind of eyeball it, onto the control arm. I just sort of eyeball the angle of this cut, tightened up the, uh, the, the clamp. Now I can cut the other side of this arm about halfway through before it gets interference from the, from the opposite of the posing arm. A good old-fashioned handsaw to finish the job. These bushing tubes are created right out of the specifications provided by Ron Champion in his book. So what we see here is 1.39, uh, 1.4 basically. The wall on here is 095. That'll be pretty close. It'll put us within a quarter of an inch of what we were shooting for. Um, the trick now is to cut that fish mouth. We could use either an um, angle grinder or we could use a tube cutter. Very important that that bushing tube be centered so you get a good weld all around. So here's a completed wishbone. And what you can see right here is that I've made a, a machined a wooden uh, sleeve to simulate the rubber bushing. I'm not ready to press those rubber bushings in here permanently yet because I, I uh, want to make sure I get a chance to paint these, uh, these control arms and, and not finished fabricating. It doesn't screw on as easily as it did prior to welding, but it's not bad. Using a small vice grip on the back side, I can just hold that pretty much in place where it's going to get welded. I don't, I'm not ready to weld that right now. So here we see the reassembly of the tire is no longer floating in space. This distance is determined by the measure that we had taken previously. The next step is to start focusing on the upper control arm.